So welcome to the Health Evolution Podcast. I'm your host, Tracy McBeath, and today we are really lucky to be talking with wellness strategist Michelle Doka from Well Balance and all the way from Canada. Thanks, Michelle. My pleasure, Tracy. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you again. Your presentation in the recent Low Carb Lifestyle Long Weekend was a phenomenal success and was just, there was so much interest in what you had to say. Um, and I can't thank you enough for being involved in that and for helping to spread, I guess, um, alternative approaches and, you know, other ways that we can look at health in terms of autoimmune and endometriosis. Yeah, my pleasure. Awesome, awesome. Well, first up, um, maybe just from your point of view, can you just explain a little bit about, you know, what it is that you do and your passions around health and we'll take it from there. Yeah, so um, I guess my title I use now is wellness strategist. Um, I help women with autoimmune conditions and endometriosis gain control of their conditions so they can overcome symptoms like fatigue, brain fog, bloating, pain um, without medications so that they can get their life back. And um, my, you know, my up until this point, I had practiced as a licensed naturopathic doctor for several years when I was living on the west coast of Canada. Um, so that's where my educational background comes from. And of course, my personal experience, I also have endometriosis and autoimmune conditions myself. Um, and I didn't actually realize I had them for a long time. I had them well controlled with um, dietary measures until I had a severe stressor in my life that actually caused both of these conditions to flare. Um, and the conditions got so bad that I was actually left bed bound for several months. Um, my life was stripped away and I wasn't getting answers from doctors. Um, eventually I got diagnosed with these conditions, um, but I ended up, wasn't getting any help from the doctors. And that's what actually got me on this path to where I am now because I didn't accept, well, you just have to live with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah. so, um, you know, one of my degrees is a master's in human biology, nutritional science. So I'm pretty adept at looking at research, scientific research. So I decided I didn't accept that fate for the rest of my life. And I started looking at the research to try to find answers. And I did. Um, and I found that the answers are out there, but it's kind of like all the researchers have tunnel vision in, in different areas. And the answers are by taking all the little pieces of the puzzle and putting them together to understand the bigger picture of what's actually going on. And unfortunately, the researchers and all the medical communities are not communicating all of this together enough to actually have that bigger picture out there for people to find this solution. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I think I'd love to come back and ask you to share all those little puzzle pieces. But first yeah. of all, I think it is a condition, as you said, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was very hard for you to get a diagnosis. And so often with so many conditions of from females, you know, we're just told to suck it up. Or I certainly know with, you know, pre-menopause, so many women are just told to, uh, you know, suck it up and live with it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, which I think is 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 obviously, you know, not the right answer. But yeah. why is it so hard to diagnose? And can you then explain a little bit around what actually autoimmune actually means? Yeah. So that's the thing with both autoimmune conditions and endometriosis. On average, uh, the research is finding it takes an average of six to 11 years to get a diagnosis. And it can take less for some women and it can take more for some women. For, for myself, I realize I've actually had the autoimmune condition like in planet since I was a child. And I realize now looking back, I've had endometriosis since I was 13 and I got both diagnoses when I was 39. So oh, wow. <laughs> wow. And that story is mm. not uncommon. I hear that a lot, mm. which is unfortunate. Um, and I mean, I guess, first of all, it's because they're both such enigmatic and enigmatic. I can't see the word <laughs> properly. <laughs> These conditions are hard to recognize. Yes, beautiful. <laughs> 
And um, so, you know, th at first, then when they start to appear, they can look like other things, right? right? And they can kind of look like before they come into their full blown form, it can just kind of look like, wow, well, I just got a little bit of inflammation. I'm a little sore. I'm tired. You know, little things that unfortunately, doctors tend to blow off at first. And unfortunately, there's this other piece of the puzzle that I've actually started to explore myself um, that I'm talking about on my Instagram page, and that is med medical bias. Okay. And so medical bias, um, I'm finding affects women, it affects um, race minorities, um, it affects LGBTQ, and it affects disabled people. Yeah. And so there's this bias in the medical field, um, and this is implicit or unconscious bias. Usually practitioners don't even realize that they're biased towards yeah. this. And unfortunately, you know, it's been kind of ingrained in the medical system, especially with women. I mean, it was just 100, 150 years ago where, you know, doctors, you know, diagnosed women with something called hysteria. I was just right? going to say that. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. So if you think yeah. about hysterectomy, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there was this belief that all of these emotional issues and all of the, you know, the, you know, we, we felt because we were in so much pain and suffering so much, it was almost like, because it affected our whole being and our personality. Doctors believed that it was all a condition of the mind or that it was that our uterus was floating around our whole body trying to find its home. Like that was one of the theories oh, that were out no. there. Oh, crazy, <laughs> crazy. Yeah, so yeah. unfortunately that's kind of still, even though we think it's ridiculous now and probably mm. practitioners think it's ridiculous, it's almost like that it's still systemically ingrained into the medical system in some ways. And so studies actually show that when they looked at men and women, if they went in for the same complaints, men got testing, they got medication, and they got consolation and words of consolation. And women were given antidepressants and told that there's nothing wrong with them. I know. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole other subject in it. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting you brought that up because it's something that I've been really since the summit, actually, you know, I think there was quite a few speakers who really noted the differences between men and women um, and how, you know, so much of the research to this point has been done on men um, and women just kind of get, well, it's probably the same with you type thing. I mean, I had no idea. I had no idea it was like that. And I think it's a conversation we need to keep talking about and people need to, you know, as I said, I've, obviously it's not just women, as you said, it's all those other people as well. But it's not fair that we're all lumped together like that and it means things like this do get missed. Oh, your sound's gone. Oh, there we Let go. Back. <laughs> Um, this isn't my field of study, but I know that, um, say, for example, with heart disease and heart attacks, it's it's studied in men, right? And so that the yes. symptoms that indicate if you're having a heart attack are, um, you know, we know what they are, but they're not this oftentimes the same symptoms as a women, woman will get if they're having a heart attack. And so a heart attack is often left undetected in women because they don't present the same way and they haven't been studied in medical research to understand how a woman presents, and, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I um, only just discovered that women can present with heart attacks with an upset stomach. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, you know, <laughs> that should be, I'm sure that's not common knowledge. Yeah, definitely. We need to continue the conversation and have mm. that mm. More research and more communication about the differences between men and women because they exist. Yeah, absolutely. So back to the autoimmune yeah. then. Um, so is so you said it's it's hard to diagnose, but even with your understanding of it, is it still tricky to diagnose? And can it be many other symptoms? Or in your mind, is it quite clear what the symptoms are? Yeah. So, I mean, I've got a pretty good sense by how someone presents, whether or not autoimmune is a risk or if it's a, it's kind of in development. And this is the other thing as well. It can be hard to diagnose because you can start to see symptoms before the lab work actually shows anything. 
Oftentimes with autoimmune, because autoimmune is what happens is that there's an immune dysfunction. The immune system isn't responding properly. And there's many different aspects to this. The immune system is a multifactorial thing. There's hundreds and hundreds of biochemical processes going on in terms of immune reactions. What can happen is that if the immune system isn't working properly, then you can end up with um, what are called autoimmune attacks. So what that means is that the immune system is, re is reacting to our own antibodies produced in the body. Mm -hmm. Right. And so depending on the condition, there's hundreds of different autoimmune conditions. You can have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune condition of the thyroid. You can have multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune condition that attacks the uh, lining around the nerves. Um, you can have um, scleroderma, which um, affects uh, connective tissue. You can have Sjogren's, which affects the um, uh, salivary glands and the um, lacrimal ducts, the tear ducts. Um, there's there's so many different autoimmune conditions depending on what part of the body the immune system is attacking. Because type so, one diabetes is an autoimmune yeah, condition as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's a, mm. that attacks the pancreas, yeah. so that um, your body isn't able to produce insulin anymore because of the autoimmune attack on the pancreas. Mm. So. Let's take thy Hashimoto's thyroiditis, for example. It's a pretty common one that a lot of women experience. And by the way, if a woman has hypothyroidism, more often than not, it's actually an autoimmune condition. But doctors usually don't test for it. Unfortunately, usually they'll just test for one hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone. Yeah. If that's out of bounds, yeah. they'll just say, okay, well, you've got hypothyroidism, take this Synthroid, and that's it. We'll just keep increasing the dose over time, <laughs> and you have to take it for the rest of your life, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I would say probably, um, I can't remember the exact number, but in what I'm observing, I'm saying, I would say probably 85, even 90% of cases of hypothyroidism are actually autoimmune in nature. Right. Wow. So what that mm. means, and you can have this tested by testing um, thyroid peroxidase and thyroid antibodies. These are two things that can indicate whether or not there's some antibody attacks going on in your thyroid. But the issue here is if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, what's happening is that the immune system is attacking the thyroid. And so the thyroid isn't working properly because of the attack. And that's why it's not producing the thyroid hormone. So what the THSH is, is, is happening is, is that your, your body is saying, well, I'm, I'm not producing thyroid hormone. Let's produce more TSH to try to stimulate the thyroid to produce the hormone. But the mm. thyroid is damaged, mm. right? And so the doctor gives you the thyroid hormone. And if he has tested for autoimmune thyroiditis, he'll probably tell you, well, your immune system is just going to end up destroying your thyroid eventually. And you're just going to have to take this thyroid hormone for the rest of your life. And you're not going to have a functional thyroid. Okay. Right. Mm. <laughs> but there are things you can do to control the autoimmune attack. And the doctor doesn't talk about this. <laughs> no, no. Is it just because they don't know? Or, I mean, do they get taught this stuff at medical school? Is that one yeah. of those things they have to you know, they've really got to have an interest in it and a responsibility to learn or? So from what I understand, because I haven't been to medical school, I went to naturopathic medical school, which is yeah. very different. The mm. What I learned in naturopathic medical school, we learn to get to the root cause of the problem. That yeah. That's that's in every com core matter of everything we learn. Understand what the root cause of it is. And if you treat that, then the condition resolves and everything heals, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, what I understand with the medical system, they don't get to root causes. They're about treating symptoms, right? You come in with an issue, here's something to resolve the symptom. Mm -hmm. And actually, this was confirmed to me twice with two separate doctors that I have. First, I went to my general practitioner and I said, look, I just want to find out what the cause of this is so that I can figure out how to fix it. And his response was, my dear, medicine isn't about finding what the cause is. Wow. Right? Okay. And then yep. when I went to my gynecologist and I said, 
I want to find out what the cause of this is. His response was, the cause could be a thousand things. Let's not waste our time with that. Let's just get you feeling better. Mm. <laughs> So this is the mentality yeah. that they're they're this is how they're trained, right? Yeah, yeah. They don't they don't learn nutrition. They don't learn you know they're about you know take this pill. It's going to manage the symptom, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's very mm -hmm. compartmentalized. Instead of looking at everything from a connected manner, you know if you have you know if you have an issue with your gastrointestinal tract, you see a gastroenterologist. If you have an issue with your uterus, you see a gynecologist. If you have an issue right with your thyroid, you see an endocrinologist. But all of them are connected. Yeah, of course. Right? I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's crazy when you think about it, isn't it? How it's evolved. But I, I suppose you've just got to delve back into history. You know what 100 years ago what we were doing in the name of medicine. Well, we have come a long way. <laughs> True. It's very Definitely. true. <laughs> and, um, and I mean, there's absolutely a place for medicine, mm. uh, right? And especially with things like emergencies, surgeries. Yes, all the problems, acute stuff. Yep. Absolutely a place for that and a need. Mm. Um, but I mean, the other thing is, is that with medicine, it usually takes about 10 to 20 years for them to catch up when something new comes out. And a lot of this information that I'm piecing together from the research is relatively new. So you're probably not going to see it in the medical system for another 10 to 20 years, mm. unfortunately. Mm. And this is why it's so important for us to, you know, do our own research and learn for ourselves. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I don't, you know, there really isn't much option, um, you know, other than to, you know, empower, be empowered to do the search, the search for ourselves and, I mean, I, I just don't think I would ever accept that you have to just suck it up and live with it. I just don't think when you, you understand the human body and how amazing it is, well, there has to be solutions or things we can try. But you're right, it's working out, well, okay, so medicine may, may not give me the answer, traditional medicine, if you like, but there are avenues I can explore. And that's why, and I'm so passionate about speaking to you, Michelle, and speaking to, to others who do look beyond the conventional approach and look at things like lifestyle and stress and all that sort of stuff. Ah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, my, my, I really wanted to ask you about these different puzzle pieces, but um, mm. just what, what's your thought? Should we talk more a little bit about, so um, what are the solutions or is it more about the puzzle pieces? Will that sort of come together? Yeah. One thing I want to bring up before I forget, and this might be make it a little bit more clear to your listeners as to why I talk about both autoimmune and endometriosis. Yeah. Um, so we've talked, I mentioned about autoimmune and how it's, um, you know, an attack on the body. And, you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of debate out there whether or not endometriosis is an autoimmune condition or not. And actually really? at this point, it's not. It's not considered an autoimmune condition, endometriosis. Okay. But okay. What it is, it has a root cause of something called immune dysfunction, right? Immune dysfunction is when the immune system isn't working appropriately. And so uh, immune dysfunction is a root contributing factor to endometriosis. It's also a root contributing factor to autoimmune conditions. And that's how they're connected. Now, immune dysfunction is also a contributing factor to other conditions like asthma, allergies, chronic fatigue, and fibromyalgia. So they are all actually connected. All these other conditions are not autoimmune conditions, but they are all connected by this immune dysfunction. And that's why studies actually show that women with endometriosis actually have a higher chance of having any of these other conditions of immune dysfunction than women in the general population. Right. Well, that, yeah, well, that would make sense. So is then the solution looking obviously at this immune dysfunction? Exactly. And this right. is a piece <laughs> of the puzzle that doctors don't talk about, right? Mm -hmm. When you go to the, the, your medical doctor, they're either going to give you a hormone to stop your hormone, your own hormone production. Um, because with endometriosis, it actually, it can feed off of estrogen and grow. Right. But what's actually happening in endometriosis is that the estrogen that's the actual the biggest problem is estrogen that's produced locally at the endometriosis site 
And what's actually causing this local estrogen production are immune cells that have gone, that are overproducing. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yep. So, so it's not the estrogen. It's, again, the immune The cells. immune system, right? Mm -hmm. So yep. you take the hormones and it kind of suppresses all the estrogen, but you stop the hormones, it all comes back because you've never addressed the immune system. Sounds right? very similar to PCOS, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, just how PCOS is treated. It's treating the symptoms, putting young girls on the pill, yeah. treating, you know, things like the hair and all the other symptoms that come with it as opposed to actually addressing again yeah. the root cause yeah exactly mm. yeah mm. right seeing a theme <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so um the other piece of the puzzle is you go to the doctor they'll either give you hormones or they'll give you surgery to remove the endometriosis but the problem is is that so many women they think that this is going to be their solution to get to surgically remove it and then so many end up complaining afterwards that it's come back and the reason for that is because the immune system hasn't been addressed and then it, it's, it grows back. <laughs> it makes so much sense when you explain it like that. It just, it's common sense, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Now here's one thing about immune dysfunction. These conditions typically have a genetic aspect to it. So usually with autoimmune conditions and endometriosis, it's usually inherited in your genes, okay. but you don't necessarily express it. You can have the genes, but not have the condition. What's required is a trigger. Yeah. yeah. And what I've actually, I'm in the middle of actually doing some additional research right now. I'm actually really excited about it. I don't know if you've seen me talk about it on Instagram. <laughs> Probably. I, I, I watch all your posts with interest. So these triggers, so common triggers are things like diet, especially inflammatory foods, immune triggering foods, additives, solvents, and, and uh, emulsifiers in, in food, um, herbicides in food, those types of things. Other triggers include emotional stress as well as physical stress, yeah. toxins, and infection. Now, here's the thing. What these triggers do is affect your intestinal barrier function. So what they actually do, you've got this barrier that protects your insides from everything that's in your intestines. Yeah. And if it doesn't function properly, that's what can trigger all these uh, uh, immune dysfunction issues. So that's what most people would know as leaky gut or something like that. Yeah, that's part of yep. it. There's other pieces of the There's, puzzle involved, okay. but that's, yep. that's one part of many <laughs> in yeah. the intestinal wow. barrier function. Yep. Um, the more I learn about it, the more I realize how many moving parts there are. It's, it's phenomenal. <laughs> mm. Mm. But so what happens is, and this blew my mind, actually, I have to share this because it's just amazing. All right. So, you know, you're good bacteria in your gut. And we think, well, good bacteria, it's, it's good for us, right? It helps support our immune system. It helps support, all, you know, inflammation. Here's the thing. It's only good for us if our intestinal barrier function is in what's called steady state, which means it's in a tolerant phenotype. So if your barrier function, your intestine has its own immune system. Yeah. If the immune cells in your intestinal barrier are working properly, they're tolerant to the good bacteria. So your, so your immune system says, okay, well, this is good and we're not going to react to it. But if the immune cells in your intestines and in your intestinal barrier function has, is imbalanced and then this is dysfunctional, it will actually react to that bacteria, that good bacteria and cause inflammation. Wow. Right. Right. Wow. So <laughs> in terms of, and by the way, everyone, you heard that here first on this podcast with Michelle. It's actually, but, actually several studies if you go for it, look for it. It's yeah, there. I'm really sure bad. there is. It's like, you know, again, it's, you know, we often just take what we know for granted, you know, as real. But when you start delving in, so in terms of how that would look in a practical sense, feeding yeah. your um, suboptimal gut, that's not working properly things like probiotics or you know fermented foods and all those things that we think we need to feed it to keep the good bacteria 
yeah. that's actually probably counterintuitive. I mean, it can be a helpful thing, right, to crowd yeah. out like bad bacteria, but it's not actually going to, it's actually not helping your inflammation and immune dysfunction if you're mm. not actually doing the work to actually heal your immune gut or your immune barrier function or your intestinal barrier function. So it's, it's like, yes, it's a piece of the puzzle, but there's so many more things that we need to consider that people aren't considering, right? It's so not what, what, <laughs> sorry, so what I was going to say, so what are some of those things we yeah. need to consider? And then I want to come back to, obviously, how we can look, like what are some of the basic things? I know hmm. it's hard because it's going to be very individual, you know, you yeah. can't give a blanket prescription, which is why you do the work you do. But, you know, some common themes around how we yeah. can heal the gut. So, I mean, the biggest things are to kind of avoid the things that are going to throw it off, yeah. right? So those triggers that I talked about with the diet um, and the stress. Now, here's the thing about stress. So emotional stress is a big one, right? Mm -hmm. Emotional stress, if you think about it, our gut has its own nervous system, right? If yeah. you're stressed, it's going to affect the nervous system of your gut. It's going to affect the immune system of your gut. And it's going to affect the immune system and nervous system of your whole body. And this is a thing that's often ignored is stress mm -hmm. management. Yep. People don't like, think about it enough. No, yeah. they We're don't. In a crazy stressful world. Yep. No one's talking enough about stress management. <laughs> no, that's right. I agree. It's something that I'm passionate about. And, it, you know, it makes sense too. You know, when you have a stressed or feeling under stress, you do feel it physically in your gut and in other parts of your body, don't you? Absolutely. But um, yeah, I agree. It's it's a huge area that needs more attention yeah. and awareness, I especially mean, as you said in the beginning, Michelle, that was what triggered, yeah. triggered all this for you. You know, you didn't even know you had it or you, you had the potential for it until yeah. you had this major stress response. Yeah, and actually mm. one study found that um, – they, when they were interviewing um, adults with new onset autoimmune symptoms, 86% of them were able to recount a significantly stressful event in their life just before the symptoms started. 86%. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's pretty That's mean, amazing. <laughs> it is. It is. But um, it's one of the things too I've learned with, um, so my good friend Tracy has, you know, she spoke on the summit. She has a daughter with type 1 diabetes. And she was saying when I've spoken to her, so for her it was puberty. Yep. You know, so stress, again, you know, it's not it's just physical. necessarily, yes, that's right. So the yeah. body undergoing puberty was enough to trigger. Yeah. I see response. it with puberty, um, yep. pregnancy and childbirth is a yep. huge one. I see so many women, especially with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, mm. I hear this so often that they were fine until they had, until they became pregnant. And, uh, you know, gave birth. And then all of a sudden this started. Wow. Yeah. And menopause can be another trigger, right? So these mm -hmm. huge shifts in hormones can definitely be physical triggers. Um, and other physical triggers are things like surgery, um, you know, major injuries, um, and not enough sleep. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Big one. Big yeah. one. And, yeah. uh, you know, like if you think about what the triggers are, well, yeah, you know, being pregnant and having children. Well, there you go. There's your sleep naturally. But if you've right. gone, but if you've got that on top of it, that's uh, your body's under a lot of stress. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Right. Mm. And so in terms of um, stress, before I forget this, I think this is very interesting. I mean, when I help with people with stress, the first thing that I do, I usually use kind of like a multidimensional approach when I'm helping people with stress management. Mm -hmm. The first step is to start to train the nervous system to stay calm. And one of the ways I do that is to um, start to do some exercises to activate what's called the vagus nerve. I don't know if you've heard yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but do you want to explain it? Can you explain it a little bit? Yeah. So the vagus nerve is a nerve that it's a very long nerve that innervates a lot of organs. Um, it innervates all of our digestive organs. It innervates some of our reproductive organs and it communicates with our brain. When the vagus nerve is activated, it tell, tells our brain that we can relax, right? Because we have these two nervous systems. We have our 
fight or flight response. That's our sympathetic nervous system. And then we have our rest and digest response. That's our parasympathetic nervous system. Yeah. We, should, we should be in this rest or digest response more often than not. But unfortunately in society, we tend to be more in this fight or flight sympathetic nervous system response far too mm -hmm. frequently. Yeah. And that's what's putting us into a lot of problems, right? Because um, that's what's kind of affecting our immune system. So the vagus nerve tells your brain to relax. And there's a lot of other amazing things that it does. Studies are actually showing that vagus nerve ac activation can actually reduce inflammation from immune cells. And studies are actually showing that immune, uh, vagus nerve activa activation can actually control autoimmune symptoms. Mm -hmm. And vagus nerve activation, there's a specific immune cell in the intestinal tract, in this intestinal barrier function that I was talking about. Yes, the we talked about the intestinal wall is important, but there's many other pieces. One of them is something called muscularis macrophages. And uh, muscularis macrophages are a particular type of immune cell. And studies are actually showing that if they become out of steady state, activating the vagus nerve can actually bring them back into a homeostatic state. Hmm. And that muscularis macrophages, when they're activated and cause inflammation, they actually specifically affect the motor neuron nerves and the motor cells in the intestines, which cause gastroparesis and affect gast uh, gastro and intestinal motility. Wow. And wow. studies are showing that activating the vagus nerve actually helps to restore those macrophages back to normal function and actually helps to restore better gastrointestinal motility. See how amazing our body is? Right? Like that's in us, <laughs> isn't it? We've just got to be aware of how to activate it. Yeah. And that's the thing with gastrointestinal motility. That's a huge problem for a lot of people with autoimmune conditions. Yeah. Gastroparesis, yeah. small intestine bacterial overgrowth is common with autoimmune conditions and endometriosis. And one of the contributing factors is because the intestines aren't moving properly. And one of that re one of the reasons is because the immune cells aren't working properly and it's affecting the motor cells. <laughs> See how it's all connected. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Of course, of course. So is it something, is it like breathing techniques or how yeah. do we, is it, yeah, yeah. in terms so of activating it? Has, yes, that's actually one really great way to activate the vagus nerve is through deep breathing. And the reason for that is because the vagus nerve, it's, it's in a lot of different organs, but we have the vagus nerve is in our diaphragm. And the diaphragm is that muscle between our lungs and our stomach. And we take, when we take long, deep breaths down the base of our lungs, it stretches the diaphragm and that activates the vagus nerve. Mm. And so often, especially when we're stressed, we have this tendency to do short, shallow breathing up here, right? And that actually keeps us locked in stress mode. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. That's, and that's, there's, yeah. um, there's other things that you can do to activate yep. the vagus nerve or create what's called vagal tone. That's another word for it in terms of vagus nerve activation. Um, so the deep breathing um, meditation is helpful mm -hmm. and laughing, singing, gargling, or humming. And the reason for that is the back of your throat, the palate in the back of your throat is also innervated by the vagus nerve. So if you activate that, that can also be helpful. That makes so much sense because I guess if you're singing and humming and, you know, deep breathing, you're probably in a pretty good, you're probably feeling pretty good. So it's just yeah. a, mat a matter of connecting those times because something I see a lot with my clients is they're not even aware when they're in a st undergoing stress or have that level of anxiety. I think there's such a, um, you know, a lot of people that kind of live with that low level anxiety all day and thinking that's, well, that's kind of normal. That's the world we live in now. But, you know, I certainly have seen that it's not, you don't have to accept it as normal. And there's plenty of things that you can do. Can't change the world, obviously, but yeah. in terms of how we respond to it and exactly. what's going on in our world, there's a lot of choice. Yeah. And that's actually the next step that I take people through when managing stress, right? You, it's, not, it's the first step is to kind of train the nervous system to stay calm. But then the next step is actually to learn how to respond differently, 
right? And so the key, I use mindset work for that because if you can learn how to see things differently and perceive things differently, how you manage your thoughts, how you see the world, how you understand the world, then you're going to show up differently. You're going to respond differently to life challenges. Even if it's the same stress, you react differently to it. Yeah. And uh, one of my favorite stress researchers, Hans Seeley, um, he's kind of the father of stress research from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. He said, it's not the stress that kills you, it's your response to it. Mm. And you have control over that piece. And so even if you're surrounded by stress, if you can learn how to change your responses to it, that's what makes all the difference. Mm. Absolutely, completely agree. It's pretty much 90% of the work I do because it is the, I suppose, I mean, I don't, I certainly don't work with, you know, a lot of women in that have the specific conditions that, you know, you're talking about, because obviously the diet is very, very important there. I mean, it is important overall, but in terms of that, it's kind of easy to learn that stuff. We, we pick that up quite quickly. You know, that makes sense. Yes. You know, but what gets in the way is, our thinking, our thoughts, you know, stress, habits. Well, you know, I I know I shouldn't be eating, you know, chocolate or dairy, but, oh, I love it and I can't stop, you know. The Mm, word should. Okay. So I usually tell people when when you should on yourself, it just makes a big mess. Mm, I like it. (laughs) Right? I kind of, it's kind of akin to our subconscious is like a five-year-old. Mm-hmm. Right. What happens when you tell a five-year-old what to do? Yeah. yeah it doesn't work out so well. No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. So if you can if you can catch yourself in the moment when you're telling yourself I should do this or I have to do this or I need to do this and replace mm-hmm. that with I would like to. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then if you find if you say, if you're trying to tell yourself, well, I'd like to do this, but then you're like, you know what, I don't really want to, then you, then it's time to maybe question if that's actually something that should be part of your life or not. <laughs> mm. Yeah, big, just little changes in, I, I guess, what you're thinking can have massive impact in, in yeah, that flow on of behavior and yeah, fascinating. So what are the other puzzle pieces that we can learn about? Absolutely. So I'll just mention about like the stress management and mindset piece. Like yeah. you mentioned, it is so important, right? Mm. And this is the thing. So is diet. But what I find is that kind of the mindset work underneath of it all is kind of like the magic sauce that makes all the rest of the stuff work even better. Yeah, that makes I sense. love that. Oh, absolutely makes sense. Absolutely. And it's a, it can be that difference, um, you know, why, how, you know, there must be so many people walking around with the potential. So we know with epigenetics, as you said, you know, just because you have the genes, it doesn't yeah. mean that you're going to, it's going to all, you know, play out like that for you. But if you think about two people walking around with the potential of getting something like this, they may have the same diet, but one has good stress management techniques and one doesn't. There probably is going to be very, it's going to be very different in how it plays out. Absolutely. Yeah. And all of these things, these triggers that I mentioned, they can be additive. Yeah. Yeah. So it, exact, you're exactly right. If two people have the same diet, but one's stressed and the other isn't, that's that could be the make or break. Yeah. yeah. But in terms mm-hmm. of the diet, um, yeah, that's obviously another puzzle piece that's really important here because what we put into our system and put into our intestines is going to affect the intestinal barrier function, right? Yep. And there are things that can, um, you know, affect that intestinal lining and cause what you mentioned earlier, that leaky gut or intestinal permeability, right? And so there are certain things that are especially problematic here, Um, some of them for everybody, and some particularly for those with um, immune dysfunction issues. Um, So what would some of those be? So a couple of examples off the top of my head. Well, first of all, glyphosate, right? The the herbicide, like Roundup. (laughs) Yep. Right. Unfortunately, this actually affects your intestinal lining, And it can contribute to leaky gut. Um, So when you can, trying to get organic produce is optimal. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and then you know emulsifiers in so this is the thing actually i just read this paper today they were looking at industrial additives in packaged and processed foods things like yeah. emulsifiers and preservatives and those types of things and they're used typically to keep things tasting fresher or to keep to affect their texture so that it's more the texture is either it's either emulsified or um, you know, so that you don't have to, it doesn't separate or that it gives a better mouthfeel to the food, you know, those types of things. So it's more appealing. Mm. But what they're finding is that there's actually not only can these products um, affect the intestinal lining and cause leaky gut, but some of these products are actually associated with autoimmune disease triggering at certain mm -hmm. levels. And wow. what blew my mind, I think it was, there was a certain emulsifier that um, the FDA has allowed a maximum of, maximum of something like 50 micrograms per liter or something. I can't remember what the exact amount was. But they've actually found certain infant formulas that were as high as 120. Oh, wow. And so this paper questioned whether or not, you know, this exposure so early in life, especially when the immune system is still forming, how this environmental exposure can impact, you know, this potential for developing autoimmune diseases in these children uh, and later in life for those that potentially they may not have expressed these conditions. Mm, that's scary. Right? Yeah. Well, and if I you look at any uh, infant formula, so, I mean, I have five kids and three breastfed beautifully, two for some reason, I just had trouble and struggled and they were mostly formula babies. And I did spend money on organic formula, but even going back, I didn't even know really a lot of this, what I know now back then. But if I, 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 if I go back and look at what's in the ingredients of, I mean, I feel sick. It is... I mean, there's all the vegetable oils and all that stuff that we know is just not. But now you're saying there's this as well. Yeah, Sorry. I mean, there's not a but there's not a lot of option, is there? I mean, if our babies can't breastfeed, and you know, I'm the first to say it doesn't always work. You know, like, and sometimes it's just not a matter of just keep trying because oh, I just kept trying, but it just didn't happen, and you know, but it, you know, does does that mean though? Um, as you said, it's laying the groundwork, but is it is it hopeless? I mean, is there still, you know, can we turn it around? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's the thing, right? I mean, even even in people that I've worked with that have autoimmune conditions that are already expressing, it, it is possible to get remission. It is possible to reduce symptoms or maybe not everybody is able to get complete remission, but you can get control over your yeah. situation. And it also depends on the level of damage that's already happened yeah. right how yeah. long you've had the condition for kind of can determine just how much of a chance you have of remission um but in every case there's always that uh, you know that opportunity to get better control over you know your your condition and the symptoms that you're experiencing and it is remission uh, as opposed to cure i mean mm -hmm. there's yeah. that yeah that's like insulin resistance i mean it's yeah. It's remission uh, or type two diabetes. You know, you can put it into remission. But if you went back exactly. to what you were eating or living, you expose yeah. yourself to those triggers again that affect your immune gut function, you're going to end up with the same issue again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So sorry, I took you on a sidetrack there, but you were going through what some of the foods were <laughs> that affected the gut lining. So yes, gluten yeah. is an yeah. obvious one, is I it? I to say that gluten yeah. is a big one. It's a mm. pretty big one. That one definitely causes intestinal permeability. Yeah. And the problem is, is with modern gluten, I mean, it's been bred now to have so much contain so much more gluten than traditional um, wheat, right? So uh, modern wheat is especially problematic and it's everywhere, right? It's a huge problem. Yeah. And it's kind of like the number one thing, anybody that I work with that has an autoimmune condition, endometriosis, it's kind of like it's non-negotiable if they're going to work with me. Actually, I won't actually work with anyone unless they've already cut gluten out of their diet. Right. Okay. The reason for that is because mm. for some people, it can create that much of an improvement for them just cutting out gluten that I want you to go and try this first. 
because mm. for a certain portion of the population that might all be that might that might be all they need depending on what else is going in their life how their body is responding especially if maybe their stress is under control and all of these other bits of the puzzle yeah. right so i don't want to take someone on if they haven't cut gluten out because that might be all that they need so i want you yeah. to go figure that out that's fantastic. I mean, would you see gluten, uh, you know, more problematic than, than sugar in terms of these? So sugar is also problematic. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, sucrose, fructose, and glucose are all problematic. They can all affect intestinal permeability, mm. um, as well as just a high glycemic load of your meals, right? So, you know, whether or not it's a sugar content or a starch content, if you have high glycemic foods... Um, this is also going to affect intestinal permeability. And then if you pair that and you have high glycemic, high carbohydrate and mix it with high fat in the same meal, that's also yeah. problematic. Yeah. So your traditional uh, burger or your, um, you French know, fries. I suppose. Yes. French, oh, your French yeah, fries. Ice cream. Yes. <laughs> Donuts. Mm. Yep. <laughs> All those foods. Mm -hmm. All the bliss point foods. I don't know if you know what the bliss point is. Yes, I know the bliss yeah. point, but please share because there might be people listening that don't. Yeah, so it's that combination of fat plus carbohydrates, either starch or sugar, plus some salt, and you mix that together in such a, in a certain concentration, it actually triggers your brain, right? It creates all these dopamine responses and you just want more and more and more. And, mm -hmm. right, there's industrial... Uh, the food companies out there, big food, they actually hire researchers and that's their full-time job is to find the bliss points of these foods so that people yep. keep craving them and buy more of their product. <laughs> yep. And like billions of dollars probably spent right? on finding that. I know it's phenomenal. I remember when I first heard that, I was just like, it's disgusting, what? isn't it? <laughs> it is disgusting. But that's, that's what we've got to understand we're up against. That's what big business want. They want you yeah. to be addicted to their products so that you so keep buying it. Yeah. And so when you see a product and it says new and improved formula, what that means is they've altered the bliss point because we've gotten so used to that bliss point, they had to kind of like move the goalpost. Wow. Oh, <laughs> I hadn't thought of it from that perspective, but of course yeah. that makes sense because we have to keep moving it, don't we? Because our body, you know, gets used to things so quickly. From what I understand, Coca-Cola has been progressively adding more and more sugar because of this very reason we get we get used to it, right? So you have to keep adding more and more and more. So 15 teaspoons or something isn't enough. They've got to go, you know. Right? Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I know we just went off topic there, but I mean, Sorry, I, guess I know. The point is, yeah, too much, too. So to, you know, that the, the high carb, high fat can affect intestinal permeability as well as, so there's this, um, there's this endotoxin called lipopolysaccharide and it's kind of on the cell wall of gram negative bacteria in your gut. We all have it. The problem is, is that if it's absorbed into your bloodstream, it can cause a lot of inflammation, inflammatory problems, and it can be a trigger for autoimmune conditions as well. Mm. And endometriosis they're actually finding. Now, what the studies are finding is that a high fat diet can increase the absorption of this lipopolysaccharide across the gut barrier. But I want to kind of point this out because in the research, when they say a high fat diet, what a high fat diet means in scientific research is a high carbohydrate, high fat diet. Right. So yes. unless they specifically say low carbohydrate, high fat diet or low carbohydrate ketogenic diet in this research studies, almost always assume that it's actually a standard high carbohydrate diet with extra fat added to it. And they call it a high fat diet. Yeah, and so they automatically assume it's the fat that's a problem, but really what the problem is, is the fat plus the, the carbohydrates mixed together. Yeah. And it's also too, they're not necessarily using natural fats either. Animal fats, it's probably, you know, vegetable oil and mm -hmm. canola oil and yeah, trans fats. And, oils, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a big thing. I mean, often when a, if a study comes out against the validity of the ketogenic diet, you know, they're feeding this. Oh, yes. Talking about the ketogenic <laughs> diet. <laughs> it just reminded me of an amazing uh, research uh, study that just came out in May 2020. 
Yeah. May 28th, 2020. So it's like really new, right? What they found was that beta hydroxybutyrate, right? The ketone from the ketogenic diet actually changes your gut bacteria in such a way to reduce the production of a particular immune cell called TH17. Yep. And TH17 is actually highly involved in the symptomatic process of both autoimmune conditions and endometriosis. And many studies that I've looked at over the, in the past, looking at TH17 for both endometriosis and autoimmune, they've often questioned how they can develop a drug to suppress TH17. So the study shows that you can suppress TH17 through uh, a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet or through the production of ketones. Mm -hmm. They actually also found that actually supplementing exogenous ketones in a higher carbohydrate diet did have a similar effect, but not as significant as a ketogenic diet. Okay, that's interesting. It makes complete sense. You know, when you understand what's going on right. in the body, you know, on a ketogenic diet. But, um, and that's why I think, you know, um, what I got from your talk on the summit was that low carb ketogenic, that's probably your minimum, really. I mean, and for some people, maybe that's enough, but then for others, it needs to be a little bit more. Yeah. And that's, deeper. The, that's the thing as well. And it goes back to this, this barrier function, the more dysfunctional your barrier function is, the more tendency you'll have to actually be reactive to certain foods. Yeah. So with the low carb ketogenic diet, keeping your carbohydrate levels low can be very supportive for the immune system and the gut barrier function. However, there can be foods in the low carb and ketogenic diets that can still be immune triggering. For some mm -hmm. people, especially if they have low immune tolerance because their gut bar barrier function isn't working adequately. And so there's a whole bunch of them, but the common ones, I mean, the big one is dairy. Yeah. And this is a huge oh. one because there's so many recipes on the ketogenic diet that are dairy heavy. Yeah. Right? And this is why, unfortunately, a lot of people, though, they have autoimmune conditions or endometriosis and they're like, well, I've heard that low carb or ketogenic is helpful and they'll go and they'll load themselves with all these dairy recipes and they're not getting yeah. the results that they want. This could be a piece of the puzzle. But it's also things like nuts too, yeah. isn't it? Which is, you know, that's, it's not heavy, especially if we're using nut flowers mm -hmm. um, and yeah. even the vegetables that we lead, you know, the cauliflower rice and stuff like that, yeah. that can be problematic too. So it's, again, it's not a one size fits all, is it? Absolutely. And that's the thing with the nuts, they can be very high in oxalates and lectins. Yeah. Lectins is another one that for if you have an autoimmune condition, it's really best to avoid lectins. Uh, lectins affect the gut barrier. Lectins are found in all grains, beans and legumes, and a lot of nuts. So to keep that in mind um, yeah. about the lectins piece of the puzzle. Um, and then the oxalates, um, for some people, especially if they do have this, um, you know, reduced immune tolerance, oxalates can activate something called the inflammasome, which causes inflammation. And oxalates are found especially high in the almonds, like the almond flour you mentioned, and then the almond butter, as well as peanuts. Yeah. So all the nut butter, right, the almond butter and the peanut butter, and then surprisingly, spinach is extremely high in oxalates, right? And I see this so often, people on their Instagram feeds with their spinach smoothies. <laughs> I know, I know. And thinking that they're, you know, feeding their body the ultimate in health. And I it know I see it too. Really case, no, and I mean, obviously, if, you, if your immune function's working fine, your body, your body can tolerate it. Um, yeah. But as we know so many people's just aren't <laughs> yeah. but that's interesting because I really want to ask you I'm conscious of the time have you got a few more minutes yep so I just wanted to ask you about um, your journey particularly in terms of um, putting your autoimmune conditions into remission yeah. because I know I supposed to cut it a little bit short I know you've shared that you were you were carnivore yeah. for around eight months yeah yep Good that uh, so, you know, can you talk a little bit about 
why you went there. And yeah. then the question I've had from that is, how did you know it was time to reintroduce? <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> So to start off with, it wasn't something where I was like, oh, let's try carnivore and see if this works. I actually stumbled across it by accident. Um, when I was sick and I was getting progressively worse and worse and worse, I mean, I was on the autoimmune protocol at the time, which is a modified paleo um, that eliminates a lot of aggravating foods like nuts and seeds and uh, nightshade vegetables like tomatoes and potatoes and, and peppers and those types of things. Um, so it was pretty strict to begin with. I was just eating poultry, fish, some meat and a lot of vegetables, but I wasn't getting better. I was getting worse. And actually I ended up being sent for a colon, excuse me, for a colonoscopy. And <laughs> With this colonoscopy prep for three days, I was only, I had to eat a low residue diet. So I was only allowed to eat meat and white bread, but I don't eat bread. So I said, well, I guess I'm just eating the meat. Hmm. And it was like this dark cloud lifted off my shoulders for those three days. Wow. So I had been getting progressively worse and worse and worse. And then all of a sudden it was just like, oh, I feel better right? Wow. And then I had my colonoscopy and I went back to AIP and I started getting worse again. The clouds started coming back, the heaviness, the darkness, the, the pain, the fatigue, the dizziness, the brain fog, the, the headaches, everything that was going on, the joint pain, everything. And actually I continued to get worse and worse to the point where I was bed bound for several months. I wasn't, I like barely could get out of bed. I was just like, what on earth am I going to do? Like my life is is closing in around me. I can't live like this. Mm. So I reflected on those three days of feeling better only me. And I'm like, is, could this be a thing? <laughs> what is this? What, what's with that? So I decided. But this was out. months later though, you said, wasn't it? So you lived with it. Yeah. So still, because again, yeah. it's so against what we exactly. think is. Yeah. Right? So, like when I first said, I'm like, I can't live with just don't, eating only meat. Like I just totally dismissed it. I'm like, this can't yeah. be a thing. But, you know, these symptoms are coming back. I'm like, maybe this is a thing. I don't know. Let's look online and see what's going on. And that's that's actually when I started getting involved um, in the Twitter community. And there's like this huge carnivore movement. And I actually, I found carnivore before I found the low carb community because they're kind oh, of like wow. attached, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So that's how I ended up in the low carb communities because I was looking at what what's this meat only thing? Is this a thing? And then I found this whole carnivore community. I'm like, okay, apparently it is a thing. <laughs> Amazing. And so um, I started following Sean Baker. I'm sure you know who he is. <laughs> yes. And he was running a 30 day carnivore challenge for January. And he's like, just try it for 30 days. And I'm like, I don't know about this. But what do I have to lose? Because at yeah. this point, like my life is is has no quality. So yeah. I decided to try it. And within three days again, the dark cloud lifted and I was able to get up and have a full day. <laughs> that is incredible. What is this? What's going on? And now that I had this like newfound mental clarity, and my brain functioned again, I'm like, all right, I got to dive into the research and understand what's going on here. And that's mm. what got me on this path of like everything, all the pieces of the puzzle that I've put together since then. Right. And so I was on it for a while and I, I was kind of afraid to reintroduce foods. That was kind of why I stayed on it for an extended period of time. Yeah. And I kind of got to the point where after about six months, I'm like, I'd like to have some other things other than meat. <laughs> So I kind of waited a little longer and then I started to reintroduce, but I did it like a bunch of things at once and I was just randomly choosing things and it was actually like a nightmare. It just didn't work out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I ended up getting sick again and I actually had to start back from square one and go back to meat only for a while until I felt better again. And I'm like, all right, I got to figure out a plan. And that's when I started doing some research into the anti-nutrients, right? The oxalates and the histamines and the uh, lectins and the FODMAPs and all the things. And I started to create lists of foods that had the lowest levels of all of these. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that I started to reintroduce first. 
Hmm. And so that's, and I decided, well, I'm just going to do one thing at a time. And then that way I know how my body's responding to it, which makes yeah. it a lot clearer. And do you find for pe other, like your patients, that mm -hmm. that is, it, it's a similar thing? Yeah. yeah. So that's what I do. Um, I usually, when I work with somebody, I will, I strongly recommend that they do what I call it the meat only reset. Um, mm -hmm. Or a modified, if they really can't just do only meat, I'll kind of like do some reintroduction foods uh, in included. Um, but I usually do that. I try to get them to do it for a month. A um, month, okay. If they really have troubles with it, we'll do it for two weeks. If they have severe cases and they we really need to kind of give their immune system an extra break, we might do it for two, maybe three months. Mm. But... I'm finding now that with all these other pieces of the puzzle that I've now understand in terms of like healing the gut, healing the immune system, doing the stress management, you don't need to be on the meat only for a long period of time. I use it just to kind of like take the pressure off the immune system, reduce that inflammation, kind of give it a reset. And then we do the healing work with the gut and the immune system with some uh, supplements and the mindset work and the stress management. And then we can start to do the methodical step-by-step -step reintroduction. Mm. Do you often find that supplements are important? You know, they're really needed? Well, I find that it kind of gets things kind of moving along more quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I do find particularly like specific dietary nutrients and some of them you can get from food. Um, specifically things like, um, if somebody is open to including like organ meats in their diet and consuming fish, you know, at least four times a week in their diet, like doing things like that, that can be helpful, but some mm. people aren't open to that. And mm. there's certain nutrients in those foods that can be really helpful, like vitamin A, um, you know, the, uh, omega-3 fatty acids and those types of things. Um, and so sometimes, uh, supplementation, um, can be really helpful to really kind of expedite the process. Um, and if they've, they've got, you know, pretty severe symptoms, those supplements can really help to kind of like get things back into better balance. Mm -hmm. And do you have, um, I mean, those lists that you've compiled, hmm. I'm not, you know, you know, you don't need to share because that's obviously part of your work, but is it, I mean, on your website or something like that? Can people find that or is that just part of the work that with you? Yeah, I haven't posted the list at this point. And the reason for that is, is that even though I've created this list, these lists, it's still kind of like, it's not the be all and end all. It's still kind yeah. of something where... You know, just because it's on the list at step one is a reintroduction doesn't necessarily mean it's the right option for you, depending on how you're presenting. Mm -hmm. um, so there's mm -hmm. still some individualization that needs to happen there, even though I've got these lists created. Yeah, no, I understand that completely. And But I think, you know, understanding, <clears throat> you know, that there definitely are foods that don't have the oxalates and, you know, can potentially mm -hmm. be reintroduced. I mean, I think you mentioned when we talked before the summit, you know, things like cucumbers and, you mm. know, iceberg lettuce and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's beautiful. Like you can have a salad, you know? Yeah, exactly. Mm. So it kind of gives you a little bit of variety. And there's some spices too. I've even got lists of spices in terms of what would be the best ones to reintroduce first and which ones to avoid for a while and yeah. those types of things and fruits. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, fantastic. So, you know, I'm going to definitely wrap it up and let you go now. That was wonderful. I, I just have loved this chat. Um, just in terms of final, a final mm -hmm. sort of statement from you, you know, if someone's sitting there listening and they really, you know, whether they know or they don't know yet if they've got a diagnosis, but I think intuitively we know that yeah. something isn't right. Exactly. Um, I, you know, one of the things I think I find that's hard is that People don't think there's other options beyond their GP. Mm -hmm. But what would you? What would be some words of advice around what they could do? I mean, obviously they can come to you. You're in Canada. You do work even with, you know, with anyone. It's all online, pretty much. Yeah. Can be. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, so I mean, the first step is educate yourself, yeah. right? Understand that what the medical system offers isn't the end all and be all there's more information out there. There's more pieces of the puzzle. It's really important for you to understand your own pieces of the puzzle. 
right? And whether that be going out and learning information or going out and getting help to understand what your root contributing factors are for your specific situation, that will help you get to understand how to resolve the issue. Yeah. And I suppose yeah. it's finding that that can be hard to find too, can't it? Because if you Google, I mean, Google can be helpful, but it can be very <laughs> unhelpful too. Yeah, exactly. There's yeah, so much yeah. conflicting information out there. And I mean, you can type so in much. any symptom and you can get everything under the sun. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's really mm. important to like try to find information from, you know, somebody who's speaking in a reputable way that seems to, you know, know what they're talking about that resonates with you, that you, you trust, right? Yeah. Because we all have different viewpoints. We're all studying different things. We all have different perspectives and pieces of the puzzle, right? Of the bigger picture, right? What, you know, my focus is slightly different than your focus. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make any, either of ours wrong, right? Our focus is helpful for a specific person. That's right. And yeah. so the key is finding someone that resonates with you. And so don't be afraid to look around and find what works, you know, the information that res resonates with you even if it is opposite to what your medical doctor is telling you. <laughs> yeah. And you have to be very brave, but that's okay. It's okay to try something different. Yeah. And don't be afraid to speak up for yourself as well. Yeah. Yeah. Like when you're seeing your medical doctor, this is a thing, right? We oftentimes the we oftentimes there's gaslighting happening, right? The medical doctors are kind of telling you like, "Oh, you're there's you're just too sensitive." Well, no, you're not too sensitive. We need to get to the root of this. I need testing. This isn't about, well, I just have some IBS, I'm going to go away and live with it. There's something going on. I want further, you know, I want to look at further into this. Yep. Yep. And what it's sometimes that's very hard to do, but I agree, you know, I think well, we're right. Yeah. Here's a great tip, actually, that I recently learned. Um, this unfortunately happens, especially with women. And actually, I learned this, uh, somebody was um, talking about this in terms of like the racial medical bias that happens. And oftentimes, testing is refused. If you're refused testing at, by your medical doctor, demand that your medical doctor document their refusal okay tell them you're not leaving until they put it in your medical file that they're refusing testing and further investigations of your issue more often than not they'll actually change their story because they don't want to write that down that they've refused testing because you know they have bias over you it's <laughs> mm. mm. a great tip yeah. that's a great tip and again be brave and say that yeah Absolutely. i know it takes courage but yeah. But prepared because, ahead of time <laughs> yes yes I remember going to a, my local a local GP here a few years ago because I was due to get my HbA1c checked and I just wanted to get that tested and he was like why I said uh because I want to see you know how insulin resistant I am and how I'm traveling and oh you well you're not di you're not diabetic you just stay skinny and you'll be fine and I was like okay I said I would like it tested and I want the results sent to me Thank you, and I'm not, never coming back. <laughs> not to him anyway. But I just yeah. thought, see, that's, you know, and again, we've always got choice. We do have choice. And if we don't get the answers from one, then we go to another and we ask. And But we don't stop asking. Keep knocking on those doors and keep trying. And The answer yeah. is out there. Just keep searching for it. I guarantee you'll find it. Yeah. Well, that's such a beautiful place to end. And again, what a great chat. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today. And if you want to get in touch with Michelle, all the information is below in the show notes. And I highly recommend that you follow her on her social media pages. She posts incredibly thought-provoking stuff. And, of course, as, as you've heard, she's incredibly knowledgeable about this. And I'm very grateful. Thank you so much, Michelle. My pleasure. Thank you, Tracy.